Hello, everyone. Come on in. Take a seat. We'll get started here at the top of the hour. Welcome. All right, it is at the top of the hour. Hello and welcome all. My name is Alan Barr with COEH Northern California. And on behalf of the NIOSH supported ERC education and research centers throughout the country, we're pleased to present the 2023 ERC ergonomics webinar series, where we offer free monthly webinars on various topics on human factors and ergonomics. This collaborative effort on behalf of each ERC's continuing education program aspires to provide access to current research supported through NIOSH ERC programs. Thank you for joining us today. If you're logged in with your registration email, you will receive a link to an evaluation form that will qualify you for a certificate of completion worth one continuing education contact hour. Um, we are offering a webinar next week on the 25th the future of work is now. First results from the California Work and Health Survey. You can register for that webinar and other upcoming webinars at coeh.berkeley.edu forward slash webinars. For today's webinar, you will be muted during the presentation. If you'd like to ask a question, then we encourage you to do so. Please enter it into the online Q&A. We will save some time at the end of the presentation to address your questions. Webinar is being recorded and will be made available along with past webinars on the COEH Northern California YouTube channel. Please do take a moment to like and subscribe to our channel. Help us continue to grow. Today's presentation, design and safety sizing considerations for personal protective equipment. Our speaker is Dr. Kana Bevan Hobbs Murphy. Dr. Kena Hobbs Murphy received her PhD in environmental health at Colorado State University with a specialization in occupational ergonomics and safety. Her doctoral education was funded by the Mountains and Plains Education and Research Center through the National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health. She was awarded a grant by High Plains Intermountain Center for Agricultural Health and Safety in support of her dissertation research regarding 3D facial anthropometrics for respirator fit outcomes. Throughout her doctoral studies, Dr. Hobbs Murphy was recognized and awarded for her innovative interdisciplinary research. In August 2023, Dr. Hobbs Murphy began a tenure track appointment as assistant professor of apparel design and production in the Department of Design and Merchandising at Colorado State University. She continues to conduct research in anthropometrics, which is the study of body shape and size, and the fit of wearable items. Her current research foci include 3D scan-based anthropometry and design for marginalized groups. And with that introduction, it's my pleasure now to hand the mic over to our speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. Um, thanks to the hosts and also thanks to the audience for being here. That was a great intro, kind of sums up everything I have on my title slide. Um, this is kind of the area where my expertise in anthropometrics, ergonomics, and apparel design meet. Those seem, those two fields seem very disparate, um, but personal protective equipment and the sizing of it is actually a very important topic, and I'm really excited to share it with you guys. So just a little agenda. I'm going to start by talking about personal protective equipment. I think we have kind of a mixed audience in terms of who is attending, what field you're from. So whether or not you know about PPE, that's where I'll start. Then I will discuss anthropometrics and what those are. Then I will talk about the sizing and design of personal protective equipment. I'll give a few examples from the literature on this topic. And then I'll talk about areas for future work, both in research and in industry. 
So we'll start with PPE. There are some basic hazard categories that personal protective equipment protect against, and this is from OSHA. These include fall hazards, so you falling or something falling on you, impact as well, penetration from sharp, sharp ob objects, compression from something rolling over like a tractor or a truck, chemical hazards, temperature-based hazards, so very hot or very cold, harmful dust like silica, light, optical radiation, and biologic hazards. On the right here is an image from University of Minnesota. This is kind of more of the basic construction worker wearing personal protective equipment. If you are in the occupational safety and health field, you know that personal protective equipment is a wide range of clothing, um, but we see a lot of people in construction wearing this type of outfit. So head protection for impact, eye protection for dust, hearing protection, high visibility jack, um, vests, and a lot of other types of PPE that just protect against workplace injuries and keep these people safe. Now, when we're thinking about PPE, perhaps some people have seen this hierarchy of controls before. It's kind of our last line of defense against a workplace hazard. We start with elimination and PPE should really be the last thing that we think about, but it is still used quite a bit in workplaces because these other controls can't always be used in, in lieu of that. So NIOSH and the CDC say that when you use PPE, you need to have a PPE program. This includes the selection and use of PPE. How, how are you picking these specific types of PPE out? Also, when you have a PPE program, you need to monitor the effectiveness of the PPE that you are using. This includes inspection of the PPE and replacement. If it's worn down, it needs to be checked every once in a while to be sure that it is still protecting against the hazard that it's meant to protect against. And then assurance of correct and consistent use. Are employees wearing it? Are they wearing it properly? This kind of has to do with sizing in that, are they modifying it? If, if so, is that the correct use? Is that kind of diminishing the protection it provides to the wearer? And I'll talk more about that in later slides. Every single employee who wears PPE needs to be trained in how to um, use PPE. And if they come from a different company, even if it, they go from one, say, construction job to another construction job, employees should be retrained based on their current company's guidelines. Because as many of us in the health and safety field know, not every company is the same in terms of how they um, interact with PPE and how they have their employees interact with PPE. So some things that are should be talked about during PPE training for employees is the necessity of PPE. When do we wear PPE and what type of PPE do we wear? Also the maintenance, how do we care for PPE? How long is the lifespan of a certain wearable item? And then how do we dispose of it safely and properly? There's also considerations around the limitations of PPE. When can PPE work and when will it not work fully to protect us against the hazard? Um, we need to understand those limitations so that we're not setting up our employees to think that they will be protected by PPE in situations where they will actually receive that hazard. Um, and then the wear of PPE, donning and doffing, which means putting on and taking off the PPE and how to adjust PPE if it is an adjustable type of PPE. And this all comes from OSHA as well. When we think about personal protective equipment, we can think large scale, small scale, very generalized, very specialized. When we think about construction workers, that's a very general type of PPE. Um, my husband used to work at New Belgium Brewing here in Colorado, and they wore high-vis high vests just like those that construction worker on the previous slide. So that's kind of a P type of PPE that a lot of different people will wear in their jobs. But other types of PPE are more specialized. So we can think about firefighter gear, turnout pants, turnout jacket. These are very specific to that career path. Medical type of PPE might be more general. Um, and then specialized PPE to the largest degree, kind of the most extreme are spacesuits. And as somebody who has studied apparel design and occupational health and safety, spacesuits are a really interesting 
garment. And actually, I don't know if anybody else heard, but Prada and NASA are partnering to make the next spacesuit, which is really exciting because fashion and ergonomics don't always come together like that, but it should be interesting to see. But that's just one example of something that, you know, the constraints are very tight and um, really that type of protective equipment has a lot of considerations that are very specific to the environment. So PPE is a wide topic. And when we talk about it, it's important to identify what area we're talking about, general PPE or specialized PPE or both. Some topics are important for both. And sizing of PPE is a topic that is important for both generalized and specialized PPE. So next I'll talk a little bit about anthropometrics. This is really where my two backgrounds come together in apparel design and ergonomics because it is the study of body shape and size. Anthropometry comes from anthropology. The study is called anthropometrics. The data is called anthropometry. And it really informs the design of products and environments. So PPE being wearable, that is a sort of the near environment. Sometimes that's what people call clothing. It's also a product, but anthropometry can be used in terms of designing car seats, in terms of designing seats on a plane, um, and lots of different products. So it's a really important field of study and it should inform how we size garments, including PPE. I'm sure that everybody who has been involved in an occupational health and safety field has seen that we can't always rely on employees to wear PPE. There can be lots of different reasons why that is. Some research completed in 2009 would suggest that comfort and fit is the most uh, cited reason by questionnaire respondents for not wearing PPE. So that says something about what is being provided to these workers and what isn't being provided in terms of different size range of personal protective equipment. Other reasons here include it's too hot to wear, it's a hindrance to work, there's a shortage of PPE. It's not enforced by their workplace. There's no training for it. They are not used to wearing it. PPE wasn't made available. The style of the PPE, so they don't like the way they look in it. And then perhaps they didn't know that it was required. So from this research, the respondents were mainly construction workers and only 8% female. So when we think about PPE sizing, and I'll talk more about this in my examples, Females and women tend to be the people who are not getting properly sized PPE because they tend to be shorter in stature. And a lot of women are entering new job fields like construction um, and PPE wasn't traditionally designed for them. But it's interesting to see in, this, in these data that only 8% of the respondents were women. And so men are having these issues with the comfort and fit of PPE as well. So back to anthropometrics, there are surveys that are done, uh, national surveys that measure anthropometrics. Commonly, these are done by the government and they are made publicly available. The data are made publicly available, but they are done on military populations. So this isn't really representative of the general larger population because there's a lack of diversity um, or a potential lack of diversity in military populations. We do have female soldiers, but largely the population is more male leaning. Perhaps race ethnicity is not as accurately reflected in military populations as it is in the general US population or the general world, world population at that age. Um, military populations may tend to be younger. And then most importantly, body type. So if we're taking anthropometric surveys of soldiers and then using that those data to inform the size and design of personal protective equipment, typically soldiers are much more lean and muscular and fit than the average American worker. And so this might be where some of the fit and comfort issues that people are citing in not wearing PPE are coming from because PPE is being designed for people who are much younger and leaner um, compared to what the actual workforce is. 
there's also private industry anthropometric surveys. This was something uh, that was done at Colorado State University when I was actually a master's student. It was called Size North America, and here's me without any hair, and now I have a lot of hair. But this is um, trying to be more reflective of the actual U.S. population. I, I did work with Size North America, and we were recruiting for diversity, so they reached a quota on people who were of a certain race, uh, gender and age, and we weren't allowed to collect data from those people, those types of people in those demographics anymore. So they really focused, and they've done this in China and other countries as well. Um, this company really focuses on collecting data that is accurate of the US population um, so that they can gather sizing information and anthropometric information about what Americans are shaped like. There are options for purchasing this data, either raw or analyzed. Of course, this isn't accessible to everybody. And so um, lots of people just go off the government published data, which again, is may be causing the issues that people have in the fit of their PPE. There are a few ways to measure anthropometrics. The US Army does surveys called ANSWER surveys. So anthropometric surveys is what ANSWER stands for. And They've done these surveys in the 80s and then in the 2010s. They use manual measuring methods or anthropometers. That's what all of these kind of gadgets look um, are about. They are anthropometers that are used to measure the soldiers in these surveys. So these technicians that do the measuring are trained by um, the people who are conducting the survey. Mainly they feel for bony landmarks um, based on bone structures. And then from there, they can kind of find where the waist is or where the um, chest circumference should be measured. And then they do that me those measurements using anthropometers. There's also three-dimensional scanning. And as was mentioned in my intro, I do some work in the area of three-dimensional scanning. This is a new way to gather anthropometrics from people, and it gives us more contextual data than manual measurements. It's 3D scanning is a digital representation of the surface contour of somebody's body. So it collects um, small triangles all over the body or the face, whatever's being measured. And that can be saved and looked at. And even in the apparel industry, we can drape virtual clothes onto um, 3D scanned bodies as if they were uh, real bodies. It's interesting that you might, let's take this measurement here, the chest measurement. If let's say this was 34 inches around the chest, this could also be 34 inches, but it's giving a very different shape of body. So 3D scanning, in offering more contextual information can tell us not only the measurement of people, but the actual shape that this measurement is interacting with. And then this image on the right gives us an example of that with the face. So if we're thinking about respirator fit, perhaps all of these faces have the same across face measurement, but perhaps the nose depth is slightly different for some people. And so having this contextual information really does help us understand the context and, and shape and size of people's bodies or anthropometrics to a higher degree. And then beyond this, the kind of newest premier type of data collection is four-dimensional scanning. So taking 3D scanning and adding a movement factor to it. So I have a little video here without any sound, but you can see that this is also all these little triangles that make up the 3D scan, but it's in motion. So we can assess dynamic fit and biomechanics of garments and how the body might change in shape and size as people move. Perhaps the abdomen or the chest swells up as people breathe and the measurement actually changes. And so these are all important considerations for sizing garments and wearables not just PPE, but all garments and wearables. Um,
So that brings us to sizing and design. How do these two interact and how does that relate to personal protective equipment? OSHA says that when you're selecting PPE for workers, you need to have multiple sizes available. The PPE should also be compatible with other PPE that the worker is wearing. And the employer should consider the fit and protection factor of the PPE. And these are kind of in harmony together. These kind of have a give and take. It's one, the fit can affect the protection of the PPE that, that the PPE provides. I'll talk about that a bit more in the next slide. And then also comfort and employee use, because as we learned from this questionnaire data, people will take off PPE because it's not comfortable. So that brings us to what exactly is fit? It's kind of a loaded word. When we think about the traditional way of fitting garments on bodies, it was static, um, tailored jackets, people took measurements on customers and it made them a perfectly fitted jacket. No movement is involved in this whatsoever. It's purely anthropometrics. Then there's also dynamic. Again, that comes in with the 4D scanning. How does movement of the body inter help us understand the interactions between the body and personal protective equipment? There's also cognitive fit. So comfort and psychology play a lot into how people wear their garments and how they think it fits on their bodies. And then protection. This is, as you see here, a delicate balance with all the other fit areas. So let's take this example here to the right. This woman who is wearing a um, high-vis jacket, we can see from WorkSafe New Zealand that this with the green check is the proper fit. And on the right side here is too large. Of course, we know this might cause issues depending on where this woman is working. Her hands are covered by her sleeves. That might be a some sort of risk for snagging. Um, there are a lot of issues with this type of fit of garment, but perhaps this worker cognitively feels more comfortable in this garment. And so how do we negotiate these two fit and protection factors? Is there an in-between size? Um, it's kind of a complex issue. The, there is also the larger issue of most of the time women find that this larger size is the only one being made available for them. So whether or not they want a better fit, they're not being provided a better fit. A little bit more about fit and protection. These images kind of illustrate, you know, how PPE can turn from protecting to actually being hazardous in and of itself. When we're thinking about respirators, if it doesn't fit properly on the face, if it's too big or even too small, you can have leaking and then it doesn't protect against the hazard that it's meant to protect against. Shoes or boots, if they're too large, this is a really big slip trips and falls issue. And you know, this woman on this illustration here is wearing boots that are much too large. And I'll talk about that in my examples with female firefighters that they having too large a footwear, as you can imagine, really can cause a lot of issues. Gloves are a, a very multifaceted um, type of PPE in terms of the considerations around the sizing. Gloves that are too large could lead to reduced grip strength, reduced dexterity. But then again, gloves that are too small could also lead to those types of reduced grip strength and dexterity issues. So that's kind of an example of a garment where perfect fit is very essential. And then garments that are too large like up in this right corner, snags, catching, reduced mobility, um, pretty much runs the gambit. It, it depends on what kind of industry people are working in, but if these sleeves, as we see, are too long and there's something that they can get caught in, it could be catastrophic. And so it's a really important issue because PPE, we, we want it to protect the body, but it can actually provide more or cause more hazards than it does protection in the in the realms of it not fitting properly. So bad fit could lead to more injuries, which is the exact opposite of what we want people to have when they're wearing personal protective equipment. So how do we solve this issue? Custom-made PPE is one way. That's kind of the most extreme example of how to provide people with PPE that fits them. 
we do this a lot in apparel design um, where we do 3D scanning, make a prototype specifically for one person and then develop that prototype based on custom sizing. So we can use 3D scans to fit digital prototypes onto the 3D body just virtually, which kind of cuts down on prototypes that you have to do um, physically, which cuts down on waste as well. And then manual measures can help inform the exact scaling of the 3D scan, because sometimes if we do 3D scanning, it might um, sort of scale improperly. The beauty of having custom made PPE is that the size is personalized. People can be assured that it's going to fit them. We can do virtual and in-person fit sessions and really address all fit related issues to a large degree. This is really great for quote unquote atypical body types um, because most products are made for people who are of quote unquote typical body types or even um, like soldier-esque bodies based on anthropometric databases. In my thesis work, I actually did 3D scanning of a wheelchair athlete and then developed a um, sportswear garment for that athlete virtually. And it was, it was great to be able to use that 3D and physical tool. Another strategy for being able to have the right size of PPE or just designing in general is designing for extremes. We see this um, in doorways, in car seats, um, in, in lots of different environments, people have designed for extremes because if the tallest person can fit through the doorway, so can the shortest person. We see designing for extremes happen when there are one or two important measurement variables like height and circumference. So how tall does the door need to be? And how wide does the door need to be? There's some adjustability that could be included in these types of designs, again, such as the seats in our cars, we can move them forward and backward, up and down in most cases. In terms of PPE, the one that comes to mind might be hearing protection. Perhaps headphones can come in and out and adjust to many different head sizes. But mostly we see PPE having multiple measurement variables that are important for the size of the wearable. Wearables do often come in multiple sizes, but it, it's a question of if there are enough sizes because there's a high level of variability from person to person. If we think about gloves, for instance, we can think about each finger's individual circumference. We can think about the length of the fingers, the, the size of the palm here, the length of the thumb. All of these things affect the fit of gloves and also affect the dexterity and the protection afforded to the, the wearer. So it's really kind of a three pronged issue, the fit, the protection and um, like being able to use, um, being able to do your job productively while you're wearing PPE. So the more variables that are included in the sizing of PPE or need to be included, the more sizes we need. And it's really not as simple as making things smaller. So if we think about this hazmat suit and a female, more of a female type form, the hips might be the right fit for both of these people, but the upper body, which fits this wearer might not fit the female wearer. It might be too large up on top. And so it's not simply just taking, giving this, this woman a size small, um, if this is the size medium, she needs a small on the top and a medium on the bottom, which, you know, any women in the audience who buy dresses, you might also have that struggle that top half might be bigger or smaller than the bottom half or vice versa. And so perhaps this is a modular system or more sizes are needed, but it's not as simple as saying height and width when we get into some of these more specialized designs. And respirators are also another example of that. Um, facial measurements play a big part in respirator fit. And in my dissertation, I think I measured about 24 measurement variables on the face. And those all come into play when we're thinking about respirator fit. And then we also need to think about inclusivity. So not only should we be providing garments, PPE for all types of workers, but we need to think about gender, um, a diverse look at gender, a diverse look at age as people might be retiring a little bit later than usual. 
also ability. Um, are we wanting to promote our inclusivity as a company and and hire people who have disabilities and are is PPE being made available for them? Race, ethnicity, and religion, we can see over in this construction site, we need to consider how religious garments might interact with personal protective equipment. And of course, many more. Everybody is um, has a collection of demographics that make them diverse. And so, you know, how are we accommodating for traditionally marginalized populations that haven't been involved in the workplace? And how can we continue to be more inclusive? So next, I'm going to give a few examples. These all kind of revolve around female form and sizing because that's really what's been prominent in media and literature. So many of us probably remember this from 2019. Back in the 1960s, spacesuits were primarily made for men. They didn't think that women would ever be astronauts, I guess. So then in 2019, there was a planned spacewalk with two women astronauts, um, these two women in the top left photo. However, that had to be canceled because only one medium torso was prepped. So it's a modular system and they didn't prepare enough of the right size for these two women. So they had to cancel and uh, this historic event and only allow one woman to go um, and have a man take the place of the other woman. So now in 2022, NASA is developing new suits for the Artemis III mission. This is the image I could find online on the right. Apparently that's going to be white instead of black. And I don't know how Prada is going to change it or not, but it's just to say that, you know, maybe now we're designing spacesuits for women and men separately instead of just one size that has been made smaller because of the unique differences between male and female bodies. Bulletproof vests for female soldiers is another area that has received a lot of attention. This is me again. Uh, I did an internship for the US Army at their Natick location. I worked with the applied ergonomics team and this was the project that they had me work on, specifically gathering literature around the fit issues that women were experiencing with these bulletproof vests. The vests are a fabric carrier with ceramic plates inside. The ceramic plates are flat for um, reasons of ricochet um, and they have to stay flat. So that's kind of the, the challenging part of designing a new bulletproof vest. But when they were full flat pieces on the front, women had gaps in the armhole um, as the ceramic plate sat away from their body because of their breasts. And this could be potentially lethal, um, having a hole and an area of exposure in that armhole area. Also pressure on the bust. Um, as ceramic plates sit, sit on the breast, that can actually cause injur muscle injury. And it's a really serious issue. It also can affect aim and firing. And then oddly enough, the ceramic plates were too long for most women. And so then when they were sitting, they were getting bruises on their legs. So now the US Army has a new modular system for bulletproof vests where the top and the bottom are different um, pieces. So you can pick the size of each. And this has been cited as lighter weight and actually better for all soldiers. Um, inclusive design is kind of what this falls under. Microsoft does it really well. They consider the user with the highest amount of needs and then the user who has the most basic needs will also benefit from that um, inclusive design. We can think about like OXO utensils that you can buy at the store. Um, they kind of are a step above all the other types of, let's say like a potato peeler because they consider people who have low dexterity, low grip strength. And so for people with high dexterity, high grip strength, it's easier anyways to use. So this is kind of one example of that inclusive design being very successful. Also female firefighters, coming back to this, um, there's some qualitative data out there. People in the uh, apparel design field um, have tried to study this to a large degree because there are requirements within firehouses for women to have PPE that fits them properly. However, it seems like it's maybe not being made available the correct size of PPE. Women said that the turnout jackets were not tailored to female bodies at all. The turnout pants were too large and they cause tripping, um, which isn't something we really want if we think about if we were ever in a 
a, a fire or a situation or our family or friends where if we have a firefighter tripping on their pants, um, I know personally that doesn't sound safe to me. <laughs> and so I would prefer them to have pants that fit them. The boots they said were like clown shoes and they were nervous on a ladder. And then the gloves were too large, they would slip off and cause dexterity issues. And so this is a very serious issue. And it also sends a message to women about their inclusion in the workplace. And that kind of plays into this next slide about female construction workers, um, more qualitative data about what doesn't work for them in their PPE. They said that the one size fits all garments are too large. So the vest, maybe jackets, fall harnesses were something specifically that they said it was supposed to be one size fits all, but it's too large for them. It seems based on the qualitative data that PPE was is not being made available and or is not being purchased in the correct sizes. So these women didn't necessarily know if it's the lack of the sizes being available anywhere or if it's just because their employer didn't want to purchase extra sizes for them. The result of this is that women might make modifications to their PPE, which can impact the protection factor of the PPE. If we think about a respirator, if somebody's making modifications to the strapping around their head, how do we know that that is done in a proper and secure way that doesn't affect the seal of the respirator? And so when we get into that modification territory, it's a little bit tricky. It, it would be better for these women to have, and, and all workers who are experiencing fit issues with their PPE, to have PPE that is properly sized versus having to have them make modification. And then the women in these qualitative studies said that women's PPE is often barbified, quote unquote, and not for work. So kind of made into cute pink colors and not really for protecting the worker. We can think of it as Halloween comes up, maybe it's like a Halloween type of garment. Um, and, you know, again, that doesn't send a great message for women. Um, and some women don't like that sort of look in their garments at all. And that's something that the women in these studies did say. So this is really concerning and for a lot of reasons. One, again, safety concerns. There may be near misses if garments are too big, impacts to productivity, and then ultimately the removal of PPE, which is the last thing we want. Why would we provide it if we wanted them to take it off? For the women, this led to poor job satisfaction and a patriarchal company culture. As you can imagine, um, the women didn't feel very included or like they were part of the company or if the company is not providing them with PPE in the correct size, um, that sends a pretty strong message. My dissertation research was regarding diverse populations and respirators. So again, here, the difference between women and men or female and male as they self-identified in our collect, uh, data for um, anthropometric collection, there was a large difference between the size and shape of women's faces and men's faces, but there was differences in all of the different types of self-reported demographics. So race, ethnicity, and age, those all contributed to differences in face shape and size. This is a very scary <laughs> looking uh, graph, but I'm going to talk through it very briefly. This was from my dissertation. Um, this is a principal components analysis. Basically, this is saying that women have smaller faces overall. So these measurements uh, in highlighted in green for women, as we can see the red versus the blue were smaller. And then nose tip size actually was another area where there was some differences between men and women. Lar men had slightly larger noses, um, not to the same degree as overall face size, but just some interesting findings from my personal research. So there are some areas for future work that I want to highlight quickly. In terms of research, it has been said that research should go from data collection all the way through to design. There are some people who have the skills to do that. Um, multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary teams might be a good idea here. So if we are looking at a population of workers, we collect their anthropometric data, and then at the end, we are providing them with actual prototypes to do wear testing. And that's my next point here is that we need to be doing wear testing of this PPE that is developed so that we understand where the issues are um, instead of just saying, here you go, here's our best shot. Um, apparel design 
is often a feedback loop system. So as we get new information, we might go back to the design phase and rethink some of our, our work. Qualitative and quantitative data together are very strong. We need to understand what the issues are and then from the word of mouth of people and then what the issues are in terms of the measurements um, and the disparity between the measurements of people and the size of the PPE. We also need to understand who is wearing PPE and who do we want to be wearing PPE? Traditionally, maybe again, men have been more in the uh, labor force workplaces like construction but we want women to be joining these workforces. We want their perspectives. We also want more diverse types of people in lots of different jobs. And so not only who is currently wearing PPE, but who are we looking for in the workforce and how can we start providing PPE for them proactively? This will lead to an understanding of diverse anthropometrics and then also considering PPE as a barrier to participating in certain workforces. This might be something that can be looked at um, because it, it might be possible that people think, oh, I can't work there. They don't have anything that I can wear to protect myself. Um, and that's also not what we want. We wanna be welcoming to people in all types of careers. And then in terms of the industry, there was interesting research about the marketing of PPE saying that not everybody felt that PPE was being displayed on websites on diverse bodies. So men who are plus size didn't see their size reflected in the website purchasing um, images. Funnily enough, this is something that in the kind of fashion world is becoming more and more prominent. They give sizes, um, they show the size of the PPE or the, the garment on say a size two and then pictures of the size 16 garment on a size 16 model. So that might be something that could be implemented in the marketing of PPE to be able to show people what size they might be wearing. It's helpful as a as a shopper to say, okay, this is the, the largest size. I see what this person looks like. This is the smallest size. Maybe I'm more towards the medium or maybe I'm more, I'm even larger. I need the XL. Um, being reflected in media can, can, provide people with security in their their choices and their their um, sense of belonging beyond that. Employers should Im advocate for employees as well. We saw that in terms of women in the construction industry, perhaps if their employer would have advocated on their behalf and said, we need so more sizes for these women, if the PPE providers didn't have them, they can be reaching out and saying, you guys aren't making PPE in the right sizes for our female workers. And so it's a difference of kind of not providing them with something or being on their side and saying, I'm gonna see what I can do about this. I'm gonna reach out to the people who make PPE and, and tell them of our need. Again, messaging to suppliers and hiring inclusivity, which I've talked about. Um, this really informs the culture and climate of the workplace touching again on who we want in the workplace, who we're welcoming in the workplace. If we don't have PPE in the right size, uh, just like the, the spacesuit example, if we are, don't have spacesuits prepped in the right size for two women, that didn't send a great message about NASA and um, you know their preparedness around having women astronauts um, be able to do work freely and, and switch in and out with men doing the job. And then it's been cited from research and kind of other sources that perhaps OSHA could have more stringent guidelines around the sizing of PPE that would put some pressure on manufacturers and suppliers to um, provide more options in terms of size. So in conclusion, personal protective equipment plus anthropometrics really does affect the protection of the PPE for the wearer. And that's kind of the, my main takeaway for the audience here today is that when we're thinking about personal protective equipment, we can see that anthropometrics plays a big role. It can even cause the PPE to not protect the wearer or cause more harm and hazard to the wearer. So when we're thinking about our research and we're thinking about the industry and PPE, this is one of the most prominent topics that I think we should be discussing. And that's all I have for you guys today. I'm looking forward to hearing your questions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Kena. That was excellent. From uh, green vests, high-vis vests to spacesuits. I love that perspective that there's such a spectrum when it comes to 
um, PPE and and the population we're trying to fit. Um, I'm going to kick it off because I have the prerogative here. Um, how did the answer and answer to database fail in the bulletproof vest design process? I don't understand. That's a military database, but and they're the bulletproof vests are for a military population. Uh, what happened? What, where did that, where did, how they missed the mark on that? Yeah, as far as I have understood from both reading and kind of, I was interning for the department that did do the answer and answer to survey. It seems as though they perhaps didn't sample enough women um, in those first two surveys. Surely there were more women that were, their anthropometrics were gathered in the second answer survey. But yeah, I think they like were- 5,000, I think in the second one, I think there were- right. Maybe. Um, so I think it might have been a sampling issue, but also the constraints of the shape of the ceramic plate because they can't just simply create a curve for the bust. Um, yeah, so I think gotcha. that, yeah. Okay, thank you. Hey, I'm just curious, um, the difference, you've seen uh, the answer to database and you apparently have worked with the Size World North America database. Well, how do they, where, how do they differ principally? What's the principal difference in uh, from the coefficients, if if we can drill down yeah, a little I, bit on that? I've never actually interacted with the Size North America data. Um, I did collect, so I was one of the people they would um, recruit participants, and the participants would come in, and I, as a grad student, guided them through the process of how to go through 3D body scanning, making sure that their body postures were correct for scanning so that the anthropometrics could be gathered properly. But I would imagine that, um, you know, we had so many different types of people come and get their body scanned um, for Size North America that I would imagine the, the data for Size North America really reflected the American population more. Perhaps the means were larger compared to military anthropometric data. Um, yeah. yeah, makes sense. I definitely yeah. need to take a look at that. All right. Um, let's see, some questions for you. Um, have you had any discussions with NIOSH testing and certification staff about incorporating the 3D scanning printing approach into resp respirator approval regulations? I have not had conversations um, with NIOSH as of yet, but that is a good idea going forward to see if that mm -hmm. could be something. Um, there was one thing that, as I started to work on my dissertation, people kept sending me a phone app where you can scan your face and then they would order and, and custom make a sleep apnea mask for you. So I think the technology is out there with 3D printing and everything that we have in terms of prototyping that type of stuff. Absolutely. Um, PPE for pregnant laboratory workers. Yeah. <laughs> How about it? Do you know of anybody that's doing this or PPE in general for maternity? Yeah, concept? I was actually, I was very surprised to see, you know, when I searched maternity PPE as somebody who was just pregnant last year, I have an eight month old now, um, that that even existed. Um, it, I haven't seen anything in terms of lab gear, lab wear. I was surprised to see that high, high vis wear even, but it's it's definitely a an area of of need, I think. You know, I I don't know hard facts, but I'm sure at least a certain percent of women will be pregnant throughout their lives. And so how are we accommodating them? Are we saying you're now you must work in the office or you know you have to go somewhere because we don't have the right PPE for you. I think it should be made more available. Uh, the first question that came in was um, asking about the 3D scanning of individual's face, designing a filtering face piece, and so forth. I think you really um, you touched on that in some detail um, about where sort of where that is and perhaps even where that's going. Do you have anything else you'd like to add to that concept? Um, I will say that for my dissertation uh, data analysis. If you're doing 3D scanning of the full body, and this is perhaps more on like the, the people who make the 3D scanners, if you're doing 3D scanning of the whole body, it can easily identify certain areas like the waist and the chest and the, the hips to gather measurements automatically using that software that does the 3D scanning. But when we did the, we gathered face 
um, facial anthropometrics from 3D scans, actually, we had to click through all these different landmark points. So part of our research was understanding if we were doing that reliably. So that's kind of the next step, I think, is, is getting more sophistication in the software, though I don't have any skills to be able to do that. But um, yeah. Got you. Uh, someone was asking if, wouldn't 3D printing eliminate the need for prototypes? I'm not sure I fully understand the, the question, but what do you think? Yeah, this is something in the apparel, in our classrooms, even as we teach young designers, um, it, it's kind of a double-edged sword because we find that if we go straight from design to virtual prototyping to final product, we are sometimes missing some issues that come up um, that we can't see through the virtual lens. This is much more prominent with fabric um, than it is with perhaps 3D printed items. Virtual fabric doesn't like to drape properly. It doesn't like to have the right properties that it would in person, though it is getting better. And so I think that there is a future for the, the reduction of prototypes and we've already seen it. It might be even reduced further and further. Um, yeah. Um, there's a comment um, from a petite female. I really appreciate the work being done on making PPE fit for everyone. Is there a higher cost for PPE for females because the need is smaller, meaning not too many women in the workplace? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case, but I would imagine it, it could be. Um, considering if you buy things in bulk, you might get a, a lower price. Um, that, that might be the case. But again, it's um, kind of a question of equity. Um, and if we're spending less on people who are an average size, maybe we have a little bit more to spend on people who are not average size, quote unquote, or different different size than the majority of the workers. Um, so it is something to consider from the employer perspective. But I think given that too large PPE that is too large can cause issues. It, it really does behoove people to be purchasing those petite PPE options, even if it is a little more expensive for them. You you cited two in one of your slides, uh, female construction workers had two papers, one from 2013, one from 2016. And I was in Vegas at a construction conference a year ago. And um, well, my question is how, how have these grievances been addressed in the in the intervening uh, 10 years? And I'll just add that anecdotally, I, I was attending a, an all-female conference, about 5,000 construction workers. And the, I, can't, I was really shocked that uh, even hard hats just weren't, that people were saying, like, I, my hard hat won't stay on. I can't find a hard hat that fits me properly. I mean, that's a sort of a principal piece of equipment of clearly um, not fitting uh, many people. Um, but, but so uh, how how are things now to 2023? Do you, do you have your finger on that still? Um, you know, it's kind of difficult to ascertain that kind of thing. When I was doing my dissertation work, you know, there are so many suppliers and so many um, types of PPE that it's really difficult to kind of track this stuff down. And that might be an area for future research too, it kind of investigating what is available, maybe a market analysis of, of sizes available and, and types of garments available. So I'm not very sure, but also in the realm of apparel design, we always try to publish and disseminate our work in ways that industry leaders will be able to use it. So I'm hoping that based on some of that work that was that research that was published that suppliers were responsive, though I can't say definitely whether that has happened or not. It seems to me the it'll be helpful this the database, the new database um, that you mentioned, Size World North America, at least for the US population, I think that would, could really go a long way towards a reality check for Americans. Well, here's what Americans' uh, general population looks like. If we could get the get the entire country scanned, that that'd be a step in the right direction. One of the attendees says that for safety bo safety boots, did women report simply the size being too big, or is there also a difference in foot shape, um, even when the boot seems to be the right length? 
Yes, actually, in that research, there was talk of that, that the shoes were very wide as well. And in shoemaking, though, this is not my area of expertise. I have a colleague, Dr. Lita Aflatuni, who does footwear design. Um, my understanding is that sh shoes and boots are usually made from something called a last, which is a, kind of a, the shape of the foot um, that the shoe is built around. And so male and female lasts typically are different. And so if we're even if we're giving women boots that are technically the right size based on just the the length, um, they could be too wide. Yes. Uh, and finally, uh, someone asks if companies are making PPE for extra tall, skinny people. <laughs> we aren't all in the NBA, they say. I, that, that is true. We are not. Yeah, I think, you know, that's another example of where height and circumference, it's not as simple as having small, medium, and large. Maybe we need small, petite, and then small, plus size, medium, petite, medium, plus size. Uh, large, slim, and then large, regular, large plus size. Although that does create more um, issues in terms of being able to provide those sizes easily. One interesting thing that I recently read, actually yesterday a colleague sent it to me, is that clothing is being returned at a rate far higher than it has been previously due to the fit. And that's not, I don't think including PPE, but in general, people are having issues with the way their clothing fits and that's why they are returning their clothing. So if you think about that sentiment for PPE, if we're providing more sizes, people will have better protection. Um, and, and it's just something that I think we need to do. It, it, there needs to be a leap that needs to happen. So, so that yeah. people who are tall and skinny can have the right size of PPE as well as people who are um, short and whatever body shape and size. Absolutely. Um, all right. Well, I think there are no more questions. I think we will we'll, uh, leave it there as a great talk. Um, and uh, I'll just offer you the opportunity, any parting words before we uh, sign off here? Just thank you all for, for attending and for the lovely questions. And feel free to reach out to me if you have any other questions or if you want to just chat about this topic. Um, that's, yes, thank you so much. That's great. That's very generous of you. Thank you. Um, everyone, you can learn more and register for upcoming events at coeh.berkeley.edu. You can also subscribe to the YouTube channel where you'll find recordings of previous webinars and other events. As a reminder, all participants who logged in with their registration email today will receive a link with an evaluation form that will qualify you for a certificate of completion worth one continuing education contact hour. If you have questions for us here at COEH Northern California, you can drop us a line at coehce at berkeley.edu. That's coehce at berkeley.edu. Thanks again to our presenter and to all of you who joined us today and the great questions. I uh, appreciate you, and we will see you on the next one. Bye, Kana. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Have a great day.